Hello, I'm Dr. Amelia King, executive director and co-founder of a Toronto-based production company called Pink Moon Studio and soon-to-be assistant professor at Ontario Tech University. So welcome to Beyond Lip Service, design thinking as a blueprint for more inclusive storytelling. In this presentation, I'm going to be sharing with you some preliminary work and ideas on our exploration of the topic. As my co-author Ramona Pringle and I reflect on a decade of storytelling experimentation at Toronto Metropolitan University's Transmedia Zone, which is a media innovation incubator that I recently led and Ramona oversees in her role as director at the Innovation Studio. So we're gonna be exploring the ingredients for a new storytelling tool that might help creators intentionally achieve truly inclusive storytelling. And I know that's a tall order. All right, so we know that while it's true that the rise of participatory culture through Web 2.0 has allowed audiences to have more control and input into the content they consume than ever before, the underrepresentation and misrepresentation of traditionally marginalized groups, including women, people of color, the LGBTQ community, those with disabilities, and the Indigenous, continues both on and off the screen across mainstream media. And the pandemic has really exposed glaring inequities in our social structures across racial, gender, class, and sexual lines, as well as at their intersections. And our media system has long been a contributor to and reflection of these problems, privileging the stories and experiences of some while erasing the stories and experiences of others. I think that we need better and more representation really is now an uncontested fact. There have been enough studies to show that it's true. Debate, though, over what constitutes true inclusion in storytelling has become a central focus of the creative community, particularly in recent years. Most agree that true inclusion requires moving beyond the lip service of tokenism, plastic, or box-ticking representation. Media critics, scholars, and audiences alike seem to agree that showing characters on screen from these marginalized groups is just, it's not enough. And if no one on the creative team, for example, has a meaningful connection to the community being represented or lived experience, there is a danger in perpetuating harmful stereotypes through the appropriation of other stories for profit. Here's a quote out of UCLA's Center for Scholars and Storytellers um, that I think really highlights the urgency of the problem well. So in light of the national conversation around systemic racism, it is well past time for entertainment media creators to think beyond on-screen numerical representation as a marker of inclusivity and diversity. And really, that's the way a lot of, let's say, diverse representation on the screen has been operationalized at the level of gatekeepers. And we know that's just simply not good enough. So an interesting case study is Licorice Pizza. Okay, that is Paul Thomas Anderson's coming of age film, um, which received very, very high praise, as you see up on that screen, 91% on the tomato meter from Rotten Tomatoes, um, and it was beloved by critics. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Mediaversity, but if you're not, check it out. This is a review website with a more holistic scoring system that examines not just a film's technical achievements like uh, cinematography, directing, and writing, but also its achievement in inclusivity, a score that takes into account intersectionality, numerical representation, diversity on and off screen, and the portrayal itself. And it also deducts points for stereotypical representations and add points for meaningful representation of characters, for example, over a certain age to tackle ageism or, for instance, ability to tackle ableism. And Mediaversity's system is held in very high regard. UCLA's Center for Scholars and Storytellers give this, this scoring system a name. It refers to it as a film's Authentically Inclusive Storytelling Rating, or its AIR rating, using the Mediaversity scores as the foundation for its own reports. All right, so back to Licorice Pizza. When you begin to dig deeper, 
the film's limitations become clear under that new lens, right, of its AIR score. So, although Licorice Pizza is Paul Thomas Anderson, who writes and directs the film, it's his first film with a female lead. According to its AIR rating through Mediaversity.com, the movie still, quote, very much centers the male gaze. And when you look at it, its depiction of its female lead diminishes her agency and personal growth in the story. That's a real problem. And the thing is, existing templates for storytelling, including Campbell's hero's journey, the reason why we're all here, have really led to a myopic and restrictive view of how and whose stories should be told. And really, none of these um, dominant models center inclusivity or intersectionality in their model. So it's evident that in order for creators to really rise to the challenge, new tools and strategies and ways of thinking are needed. Okay, so enter design thinking. You see those uh, crappy traffic signs that would give all of us um, a bajillion tickets? Well, design thinking is a robust and highly successful methodology that attempts to solve the problem of crappy design by putting the human being on the other side of that traffic sign first. So you wouldn't have this if you put it through a design thinking lens. All right. Now, the design thinking process has five nonlinear stages. The first involves understanding in a deep way the people that you're creating for. That's known as the empathy stage. The second involves stating clearly the user's needs and challenges, the definition stage. The third stage involves brainstorming solutions using insights derived from that first stage. So you're moving away from your own initial and potentially myopic assumptions as the designer. The fourth stage is about creating a minimum viable product, a non-resource intensive but meaningful representation of the solution. That's the prototyping phase. And the final phase or stage involves getting feedback from the end users on that prototype. That's the testing stage. And because this is an iterative process, um, the design team doing the work will often move back and forth between the stages, modifying the solution until feedback from the users is positive enough to warrant moving forward. And really this process has been adopted by some of the world's most powerful and innovative firms, including Apple, Disney, Google, IBM, and others, most often though being used for product, service, and experience design. All righty. So although design thinkers have long embraced storytelling as a core tool in their process, using it to derive insights, build empathy, and understand underlying problems, the formal application of design thinking to storytelling is still in its infancy. But what if we use design thinking to solve the problem of crappy storytelling using the attainment of high AIR score as our ultimate goal. So in our chapter, my co-author Ramona and I explore what this new methodology could look like, taking into account both its virtues and limitations. So what would the analogs for each design thinking phase be when applied to storytelling? How do we leave room for an organic process while providing enough structure to help creators overcome their own limitations with respect to inclusive storytelling? to help them avoid biases and appropriation. So I really look forward to discussing this with you today. And I thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this presentation.